admission uh, program. Had a wonderful uh, presentation from them. During Sunday school, they will be here for the potluck after which you are all invited to come and be at. And you can ask him any questions you have after that. And he will be delivering the sermon during our worship service today. Our worship service begins on page 184. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sins. We pause for a moment of silent confession before our God.
we continue with the singing of our sermon. Good luck, depending on where the life instruction. 
Um, and he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. It was just his bad luck. Often we use the word luck without too much, <coughs> with too much thought about what we are saying, but the word implies a lot more than we actually realize. When we say good luck to that athlete about the coming game, good luck on the game, we are saying that they will need luck to win because their skills aren't really that good. And do we really believe that luck will change that skill ability that they have to win the game? Sometimes we use luck to explain why something happens that can't be explained in any other way than to say it was a matter of luck, or chance, or fortune, either good or bad. Now science says that on the first impressions you might think that things happen randomly. But even in this randomness, there is a kind of pattern. This has nothing to do with luck. Let's so if you flip, for example, a coin, and it seems that it's just luck that it comes down heads or tails, and you continue this for, flip this coin a hundred times, it's not simply by luck that half the times it will come up heads, and the other half it will come up tails. And what's interesting, if you stop and think about it, the word luck doesn't appear anywhere in Scripture. That's strange in a way, since fate and luck were such popular concepts in the ancient world. That term luck comes from the Greeks and the Romans. It was fortune. It was fortune. May fortune be with you. May luck be with you is where it comes from. Um, in the Bible, nothing is left to luck or chance. The Bible gives us a scripture of God, of a God who cares, who listens and acts beyond the sense of human history, who acts beyond our own lives. His divine providence, his wisdom, his foresight oversees everything that happens. Nothing happens that is outside his control. He even uses evil events and people to bring about some good ends. And it would be interesting to actually to go through the Bible to see how many times the words, but God, are used in the same way they are used in today's text from Genesis. Joseph said to his brothers, you plotted evil against me. But God turned it into good. The word but God involves some kind of human foolishness or disaster that God, God uses to bring rescue, that he uses to bring blessings and what he uses to bring goodness. Even if the words but God aren't actually in the text, they could be implied anyway. For example, God commanded Jonah to, he called him to, to the people of Nineveh to turn away from their sinful lives. What does Jonah do? runs away. He didn't want that assignment. So he ends up, what, swallowed by a fish? But God rescued him and saved the people of Nineveh. Or Daniel, who's thrown into a cage of lions, but God sent an angel to shut their mouths, and Daniel was unharmed. The king and all the people worshipped God. When God, David killed Goliath, it wasn't just a lucky shot that brought down the giant. David made this clear to Goliath. You might be big and mean, but God will put you in my power, and I will defeat you. Not because I was lucky. Today's reading from the story in the book of Genesis could be read just as a good luck, bad luck kind of story. It's about Joseph, you know, that spoiled kid in the Old Testament who given that fancy bright colored coat by his father. Jacob, bad luck for his big brothers that this little kid was their father's favorite. And his jealous brothers wanted to do away with him, but it was just good luck that one of the brothers felt bad enough about murdering him, so Joseph was sold as a slave. Joseph ends up in Egypt, and he got a lucky break and ended up in the house of a rich man. Through a stroke of bad luck, he ended up in jail on a trumped-up charge of rape. Then through a series of events that could be interpreted only as plain good luck, ended up as prime minister to the Egyptian pharaoh. Well, at the same time, bad luck struck his brothers because famine wiped out all their crops and so had to go to Egypt to find food. When the brothers found out eventually through this, these events, found out that the Egyptian ruler with whom they had been dealing was, was their brother, they had tried to kill, they really believed their luck had run out at that point. Think about that. This brother that you had thought about killing, thought about sending away, now holds his life in your hands. 
big wolves in his hands. You know, your luck had run out. But as I said, luck or fate or chance are foreign concepts to the Bible. And Joseph makes this quite clear when he explains to his brothers they had, that they had no intention of getting back at them for what they had done to him. The brothers were expecting the worst, but Jesus, Jesus, Joseph saw things differently. Joseph saw the hand of God behind everything that had happened. And he explains this to his brothers. God sent me ahead of you to rescue you in this amazing way to make sure that you and your descendants survive. It wasn't, it wasn't really you who sent me here, but God. He has made me the king's highest official. It wasn't by chance Joseph had risen to a position of power and was able to help his brothers and their families. God had used all the hatred his brothers had for him to save them in the end. Joseph explained you plotted evil against him, but God turned it into good in order to preserve the lives of many people today because of what happened. Joseph must have wondered, as any of us would, why is this happening to me? We even ask, God, what are you doing to me? Why are you allowing these things to happen? It's later, as he looked into the rear vision mirror where, where he had been, that he could say, but God, all these bad things happened to me, and God permitted them to happen, but God used them to save my family and their children and the generations to come. God was behind the scenes working good into their evil purposes. I can't go on without referring to another but God story in the Bible. Peter tells it like this on Pentecost Day. Jesus was handed over to you and you killed him by letting sinful men crucify him. But God raised him from death setting him free from its power, because it was impossible that death should hold him prison. Evil was at work, but the first Good Friday, an innocent man captured, put on trial, whipped, mocked, cruelly treated, and nailed through hand and feet to a cross. What could be more atrocious than that? One of the biggest mistakes in history becomes the very epitome of love the beginning of new possibilities and new hope that would come into human lives, into our own lives today. God used the evil of that day to bring forgiveness, to bring eternal life into the lives of all people. We can even use Joseph's words here, God turned the evil into good in order to preserve the lives of many people. So whenever we hear the words, but God, or they are implied as God uses the circumstances in our lives to bring about good things and blessings, we know that God is always in control. There are times when he permits bad things to happen, but they don't happen outside of his control. God allows them to happen for a reason, and that reason is always bound up with his love for us. Sometimes, and perhaps more often than not, we can't see the reason why. God permits bad things to happen because his ways and thoughts are far beyond our own. We can't think like God and we don't have the wisdom of God, but we can trust his love. The story of Jesus, the cross and the tomb, the story about Joseph and his brothers say very loudly that not everything happens is good. Horrible things happen. Babies die, mothers get cancer, parents abuse children. We have Kiev, we have Highland Park, we have Auschwitz, and the list could go on. We have famine, and we have war, where people are suffering in a way we can hardly begin to imagine. There is no way in the world we can begin to understand why these things happen on such a massive scale. And we know that God doesn't cause evil to happen. We do a pretty good job of, at creating evil without any outside help. Terrible things happen in our lives. Some are our own making and others seem to come unexpectedly. It's not a matter of good luck or bad luck. In faith we believe that God is always close by as we travel through dark times and along unfamiliar roads. 
Joseph didn't know why things happened the way they did as they unfolded. And he didn't have the advantage of a crystal ball to see that all the events in his life would end up bringing blessings to his family. But one thing he was certain about, God was traveling along with him. Like Abraham who obeyed God and picked, packed up everything and traveled to an unknown destination. Like David who defied the giant Goliath. Like Daniel whose obedience to God meant persecution. Like Peter and the other disciples whose loyalty to Jesus made life hard and in the end cost them their lives. Like Joseph, who must have often wondered where life is taking him, we too are on the journey, and we don't know what lies around the corner, but we do know who is traveling with us. And we don't rely on luck to get us through, but on that sure, certain love of God that we know through Jesus. It's a kind of love that is persistent, that's committed, and never gives up, that kind of love that gives us peace and contentment even when we are totally confused about the events of our lives. So as you leave this morning, as you go out into the world, remember, you do not go alone. You go with each other, and God goes with you. No matter what the week may bring, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will remain with you and bless and protect you and give you the peace that comes from knowing that it's not love that controls you, your life, but the loving hand of the Almighty God. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever.
what others mean for evil against us, that you will work for our good. Help us to forgive them for Christ's sake, as you have forgiven us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And weeping with those who weep, we cry out before you, Lord, to comfort all mourners with your spirit in the time of sorrow, especially Cindy and Terry, Marsha and Lauren, Steve and Charlie, for Francis and Pam, for Carl and Norma, for Linda, Sandra, Robert, and for the family of Henry and Marge upon the death of their daughter, and for all of those that we now lift up before you in the silence of our hearts. Sustain them in the truth of your Son's resurrection, victory over death, for all who believe in him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. O oh, Father, though we walk in the midst of trouble in this broken world, you preserve our lives in your Son, who forgives and sustains us with his body and blood. Stretch out your hand against sin, death, and hell to deliver us from their wrath. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. And Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are merciful. And through Christ you have promised that you will neither judge nor condemn us, but graciously forgive all our sins and abundantly provide for all of our wants of body and soul. By your Holy Spirit, establish in our hearts a confident faith in your mercy. Teach us in turn to be merciful to our neighbors, that we may not judge or condemn others, but willingly forgive all, judging only ourselves. We blessed lives in your fear. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament from the pound beginning on page 194. The Lord be with you.
same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you.